Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the joys and blessings that you give us each day. At this time, Father, we thank you for this time we have to be together, to study your word, to find out what the minor prophets did 
and how we can learn from them. Father, we ask that you be with us as we go through this class. Help us to be attentive. Please be with Doug and let him have a ready recollection of the things that he has, has studied and that he's going to present to us. Be with us for the rest of this class and for our service afterwards. Please forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Since God gave me three or four weeks to prepare for this one, <laughs> in a way, there's enough stuff here that I, that God shared with me, and we can probably spend two or three weeks on this, especially with discussion with it. But we'll try to uh, work through and go through. Uh, there's an actual quote from the Jefferson Memorial that says, I tremble for my country when I ponder that God is just. Never take time to ponder that. But we serve a just God. A God who says that eventually evil is going to be punished. Right? And we'll just take a look at it. So that was back in Jefferson's time, right? How much more have we gone to the dark side, if you will, since then? And where we are now. God starts out through Zephaniah in chapter 2. It says, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather together, O one the desirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, O you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the days of the Lord's anger. What's that sound like to you? You just talked to him in chapter 1 about disaster coming. You stepped away from me. You're not following my ways. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Sounds like you've given him a last shot, right? Does God really want to have to destroy all of us? No, that's not a desire. Desire to save us, his desire to love us and have us love him. But he is a God of justice. And so if we choose not to follow him, then he's going to bring on the destruction. But here he comes in one last time and says, I'll give you a chance. Seek me. I sort of liken that to a six letter word that we probably shy away from, I think. We hate it. It's not a four letter word. Six letter word. Uh, I think what it is? Repent. Uh, is that a one time thing? Hopefully, we have a pretty deep understanding, feeling within our heart on the day we're baptized. And the night day that we have to become a member of God's family and stuff, and we confess our sins and we repent and change. But we always stay true. Uh, we have trouble, we struggle here, we struggle there. How do we handle that repentance later on? Do we do it? Or is it trust in oh, my God's merciful? He's so let me offer that one. He actually calls us to repent. How do we look at that in our world? Do we not? In a lot of cases, it's feel sad, you know. It feel like, yeah, I understand that was wrong, but I, I, I shouldn't have done this, or I shouldn't have spoken that way, something like that. As, as long as you sort of recognize it and you have that uh, negative feeling and stuff about it, then that's what good. You're okay. Is that what we mean? Your head shaking. No, it's not what it means. Most of us should probably repent every day, but we don't because we do just what you said. We try to justify it. We move around and 
well, it'll be okay. But it's really not okay. And, you know, it's like asking God to forgive us. We should be doing that every day because we sin every day. And, but sometimes we don't, but we should. We should. And so should have them back in Zephaniah. Give me one of those Hebrew words to come back to. Teshuva is Hebrew that goes to repent. And it actually has the idea behind it of action. Sort of like here. The word here, both in Hebrew and in Greek, doesn't just mean it comes in here and it makes contact, you know, physically with that drum and you send a signal over to your brain and you recognize uh, the sound out there. The intent and understanding of the word here is that you, when you get that message, you hear it, and you're going to obey it. You're going to put something into action where you follow what you just heard. And repentance to the Jew means you change. It's not just, okay, I recognize I did it wrong. It's, what do you do differently now? Are you really dropping the stuff and change your life to be different in the way that you go about what you're doing? Well, that's the difference, too. I don't know if we should have to. I think if we have to repent every day on the same circumstance, you're not doing it right. Uh, you ask for forgiveness every day because we all sin and all of that. But if we're having to ask for, or not ask for repentance, but if we're having to repent on the same circumstance every single day, you're, you're not repenting. Repenting means to turn away from. So if you are continuously putting yourself in the circumstance that leads to you needing to repent on that same thing over and over, you haven't turned away from it. And I think we got to understand the, the difference in asking for forgiveness and the turning away from that is repentance. Right. It's a good one. Have you, have you really left it? And in some of our cases, it might be, you know, oh man, I really like that, you know. I really sort of I still have that attachment there. I really don't want to leave that behind. Man, you know. So we try to think of a way we can rationalize the way we deal with it, right? Instead of just really, okay, God says that's not appropriate. That's not in keeping with me growing in God's holiness and righteousness. So I just need to drop it. And so we end up the scenario of support he's given us there, which probably happens to me in some cases, and you really haven't repented, right? You really haven't changed. And that's what the goal of our Christian life is. Ultimately, when I get up and look at the man in the mirror every morning, who does God want me to see? It's amazing that my goal is what? Christ. You look like Jesus. Man, the words I say, the way I interact with people and all that, do I look like him? And if I'm not, then I'm, I've got change in the that's an everyday kind of thing, really. And we'll probably never get to completely look like Jesus and behave like him while we're here. But we should get that way. And it's more and more and more and more as we grow into his likeness, then technically we should sin less, right? Because we're coming more like him. Our heart is more in tune with God, more aligned with what God always wants. And so my behavior and my thought patterns and all that are just to him. That's what Zephaniah is calling us to. You have a chance. I really don't want to have to wipe you out. Come see me. Really look after me and my ways and take them on to be the way you behave and the way you live. That's what God is calling to his people. And I think not just Judah back then, to us today, say, I call you to be my people. I want you to look like me to the world around me. So before I come in here and wipe you out, I'm really pleading with you one last time to change the way you live. He goes into the next verses and really the rest of the chapter is even about people around him. He's going to talk about the people of Assyria that's going to get mentioned again. The reigning world power, if you will. They're about to go out they're still reigning. And talk about Ammon and Moab. I don't remember who those are. Where did those people come from? God did 
didn't allow the people of Israel to inherit these lands when they came over. Where did Ammon and Moab come from? Those are the children of Lot, Abraham's nephew. God shut them up and gave them their lands. But we see in Zephaniah 2, when Judah ran into all their trouble, Ammon and Moab were, all right, hey, good. They were really on the side of all the oppressors of Judah. Not what God said. They're, they're brothers and sisters of the people of Israel. They're still family. And yet, they were happy to see what was happening. Huh? God talks about Phoenicia and Philistia over here, all these people on this side. So he basically goes around in the rest of chapter 2 and surrounds the nation of Judah. So I'm, I'm going to put punishment on Judah, but I'm not going to forget what you guys did either. So, for Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon desolate. They shall drive out Ashkelon at noonday and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. That's the Chaldeans up there. The word of the Lord is for you. There's a, excuse me, the word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, the land of the Philistines, I will destroy you so that there shall be no inhabitant. Uh, some of the reading I did of the Cherethites, they took that as if the people came from Crete and came over, and that's the word they used for the people from Crete that actually came over and having that sea coast there and built up the uh, uh, seafaring business and stuff in that area. So the sea coast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds for flocks. The coast shall be the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there in the day in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God will intervene for them and return their captives. And people see this as a picture of what's going to happen because after the people of Israel and Judah were both taken into captivity, and then just a few years after Judah went into captivity, uh, Cyrus turned around and all that, and he started to send people back into the land that they actually did set up holes for flocks and all that kind of stuff over there on the streets, just like Zephaniah has prophesied here. So, chapter, verse 8 says, I have heard the reproach of, the reproach of Moab, the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of the hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. Anybody remember the Sodom and Gomorrah? How well did they come out? All salt pits, all fire, right? Destroyed and simply because, again, they didn't repent. They lived in their evil away from God's ways and would not change. So, God had to fix it. The residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This they shall have for their pride, because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome to them, for he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, and eat all the shores of the nations. Another reminder of how much our pride is to our detriment, right? The pride of the people there, they refuse to listen to God. They think they're big in something. They can do all these things on their own and handle things and didn't do so well. So the Lord will be awesome to them. How would you like to stand in the face of God's anger and have to deal with it? Sound exciting? I know as a young guy and all that stuff growing up, my dad didn't lose the same head too bad as far as you know, getting really, really mad, but it was pretty evident when he did. And when he got really, really mad, he didn't want to be around. Just stay out of his way and go and all that stuff. And it, it wasn't a fun thing, you know? Especially when you knew there was a whipman on the way that to go go to your room, I'll be in there shortly. Well, that, that was not a fun few minutes while you're sitting there waiting for him to come to the door, you know? see what was going to happen after that. If we don't have some sort of, if you will, respect and awe of God, it's even worse than that, much, much worse than that, then there's something amiss probably with our relationship with God. Because he is an awesome God. If he gets angry, I don't even want him to be there and be the, the, the brunt of his anger. But that's what these nations are going to be. 
Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation. As dry as a wilderness, the herd shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge in the capitals of the pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, and he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwells securely, that said in her heart, I am, I am it, and there is none beside me. How, how has she become a desolation? A place for the beast to lie down. Everyone who passes by her shall kiss and shake his fist. We got that last week. We went over the or week before, I guess, actually, the other prophet and stuff about how Assyria was going to go down. Ethiopia, I don't think there's on here. Where's Ethiopia at? Do we remember? No. Ethiopia is over here, just below or north of Egypt. Going. Some of the people I read actually think this is thinking of Egypt and Ethiopia together as the other power that's a big international power at that time. That's where the Ethiopians come in too. God surrounded the whole people. Assyria was going to go down. The Ethiopians thought that they couldn't be overran. They were pretty well secure in their own power. But God took care of that with them too. But Assyria at one time tried to come down. You remember how Josiah died? Josiah was one of the good kings of Israel. He took over at eight years old. And by the time he was a teenager, he got into God's word and he started some renovations and stuff of how they did things. He was trying to bring them back to God's Word and bring back the worship of the temple the way it should have been, the feasts and that kind of stuff. So he had a pretty good time with them, but he actually set up where he was, in fact, a vassal of Assyria up here. So he had to pay him fees. During his reign, Egypt came up. Egypt was going to try to overrun Syria and be the only power in the world again. Josiah came out and tried to intercede. Went up and the king of Egypt said, Hey, probably ought not mess with me and stuff. You know, you don't have enough power to put up with me and all that, so just leave me alone and let me go. I'm not going to mess with you, just leave me alone. And Josiah didn't listen to that. He got killed in the battle of Egypt and all that. And then Assyria eventually came down and wiped out Egypt. But all those nations around, God said to them, You're not. You guys aren't any better off than Judah is, really. You've been sort of rejoicing over what happened to Judah, but you're going to meet your your fall down, too. So it's all there for us to go back and learn from and go so we can get better in how we live. Hebrews 12, chapter 6. And I know Hebrews chapter 12 is a, a really good chapter, but got a lot of things in it. Verse 6 says, whom the Lord, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. But what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God tries to get us to follow his ways, right? He tries to chasten us, to keep us right with his ways, his ideas of how we ought to operate. How do we react to that when God tries to chase us? What he's doing to Judah right now, right? He's trying to direct him to say, that your path of life is not right. Why don't you come back to my way? If they not listen, things are going to get really rough. So when he tries to chase us, what's our response? Because no one likes it in the moment. Yeah. The verse says, Yep. It's not pleasant, right? In that moment. But if we have a long range view to what it's coming to do for us, then we should submit to it and take it, right? Learn from it. Because you know. long range view again is God's intent is for me to look like Jesus. That's why he's chastening me. That's why he's disciplining me. So I need to accept his discipline and his chastening. So that I can learn from it and I can be changed into a person that more accurately reflects his way of life, his way of doing things. Jeremiah chapter 5 has a 
very discouraging kind of look. Uh, but he comes out and he's tried to look through Judah and find a righteous person. Anybody remember what the results of that search was? Found no one. I want. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drop of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my, my iniquity has not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with psalms of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye upon you. Do not be like the horse or, the, or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit of bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. That's Psalm 32. Coming back. Our action, our heart's reaction to God's discipline is a thing of great importance in the way that we respond to God and how we live with Him. And the people of Judah would not listen. They would not pay attention to where He was. So, you know, comments on that desire. We, our, our need, our, our real heart to God to say, hey, when do I recognize that I'm not in line with Him and am I willing to repent and make my <coughs> Submissive to him, take his chastening so I can grow and prove my likeness of Jesus. That, that's, that's really a big deal with each of us as to our relationship with him is how willing am I to be shaped and formed so that my life becomes more like that of the master. So chapter three. Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to God, to her God. Her princes are in her midst, are roaring lions. Her judges are even evening wolves. They lead not a bone to warning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust knows no Good description of the nation there, huh? When David uh, made his mistake with Bathsheba, right? there was a prophet who had a job to do with that, right? David did what he did. When Bathsheba sent word back and said, hey, I'm pregnant, David then did what? Started to die. Didn't, okay. Didn't accept his behavior at all, right? The army was out at war. He chose to stay in the city at the time. So Joab and the army were out. So David sends a note to Joab. says, send to Uriah, who happened to be Bathsheba's husband. Now, so send him to me. I'll try to. David repeatedly tries to get Uriah set up, getting drunk and all that kind of stuff. And, man, he's been away at war. He's certainly going to want to see his wife and all that stuff. And he calls him back and does it. So he does that repeatedly. And. Uriah, as a man of honor and all that, says, man, the, the army's still out. They're out in tents. They can't come home and be with their wives. That would not be appropriate behavior for me to do that while all my comrades are out there fighting. So 
but he does not go home. David's response to Uriah's behavior is what? Huh? Put him up there. Since the letter to Joab says, put this guy right up there where there's no doubt he's going to be killed. You know? Some of those tactics Joab might not otherwise have employed. You know? Going right up to the walls of the cities in those days was uh, not, not a way to keep your life in its safest condition. But he, Joab followed David's direction. Seems sort of odd to me that Joab was the leader. Do you remember who Uriah was when it comes to David, his relationship with David? What did Uriah do for David? Go back and look through the Chronicles, and then the, the, there's a list of the 30 mighty men that served David. They've been with David ever since basically Saul became a pain in David's life. Uriah was one of them. One of David's 30 mighty men. He had had a relationship with David for a long time. Now, when David commits sin, Uriah is in the middle of it because David's sin is with Uriah's wife. It seems like David's respect or appreciation for all that Uriah had done for him goes out the window. He turns around and Uriah won't go back to his wife like David tried to get him to go. So instead of being appreciative of his honor or of his behavior that's more righteous than his own, David says, let's just kill him. When he's gone, Uriah got killed. Joab sends the message back to say he was dead. David wasted no time in taking Bathsheba as his wife. Whole series of problems, right? An interesting picture when you come back and look at it compared to the nation of Judah, right? Same way. They had, had times, they, they had opportunities to recognize what they were doing wrong. They had opportunities to own up to it, say, that's my sin, that's my fault. But they didn't do it. They just in the words of Van there, they, they just look for more and more to say, how can I work around that? But God used a prophet. Remember who that was? Right? Nathan got a job. God said, I need you to go talk to King David. Right? So Nathan goes to talk to King David, tells him a neat little story about a poor person who had with one lamb. You know, some rich man comes in, they need a banquet for him and all that. So the rich man, instead of taking from his own flock, no doubt takes that poor man's one new land that that poor man has put all kinds of time and energy into raising. And he takes his land instead of using one of his own. David's response was, yeah. Ah, that guy, man, that's a terrible behavior by that guy. That guy ought to die. Nathan had to wake up the king and say, you are the man. You're that guy in the story. Not an easy job for Nathan to go do, right? But Nathan did shy away from it. He went to the king of Israel, probably the most powerful guy in part of the world right then at that time and confronted him with his sin and say, you are the man. And that's what Zephaniah is doing with the leadership of the nation of Israel right here. You've got to recognize that you're not doing right. You've got to own your sin. And until you own it, as an earlier discussion about sin and repentance, until we're willing to admit that the sin is ours, we can't or won't do anything about getting fixed, right? So we've got to admit who the problem is. And the problem in a lot of cases is me. And I've got to own up to it. I've got to own my sin and recognize that to be able to go before God and say that I need your help. And that's what God's trying to get across to the people of Israel. He comes back in verse 8 and says, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to assemble all to my assembly of kingdoms and pour on them my indignation, all my fears, anger, 
All the earth shall be devoted or devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will store to the peoples of a language, a pure language, that they will all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In that day you shall not be ashamed any more of your deeds in which you transgress against me. Then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. You shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. That's a much more hopeful picture, isn't it? What's it take to get there? Huh? The change all the way to Ethiopia and all that. Uh, some of the things I read even took that all the way back to the Tower of Babel when God confused the languages of people and this time He's drawing people together. He's going to give people a pure language to bring people together. Almost like He's restored it back to say we're all going to talk one language and we're all going to submit ourselves to the Lordship of God to say He is the one that's here. He is the one that brings us over. So, I almost have to come back to the, looking at Ezra and Nehemiah came back. Uh, we'll get into the post-exilic prophets and stuff starting next week and go on. But Dante wrote a picture of his, uh, probably some of us probably read that book, but Dante's in front of those. Well, he gets a picture of what the entrance to hell is going to look like, well, how terrible and ugly it's going to be. And all that. And some people don't seem phased at all to go to. It. Some other people, it raises the hairs on their head and all that stuff, and around the rest of the body and say, boy, that's an ugly place. I don't really want to go there. I don't really want to do what you want to do, uh, or, or that ugly place to go. Deuteronomy 28. If you go back and read Deuteronomy 28. God tells the people before they ever go in to take the promised land to say, Here's the blessings that will come upon you and stuff if you follow my decree. On the other hand, here's the bad things that will happen if you don't. And in Deuteronomy 29, Deuteronomy 29, he renews the covenant with them. And says, I really want you to be my covenant people. I want you to obey what I have given you to do and the law that I gave you. And I will be faithful to you if you will be faithful to me. That's really where he's taking that's what the last few verses of Zephaniah are all about. Uh, people think this is one of the more messianic times. Uh, one of the things that he talks about, he says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, heart O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. And that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, let your, not your hand be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom the reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. In that time I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you, for I have given, for I will give you fame and praise on all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. God desires to bring us back. He's actually going to give praise and honor there. What's he tell you in verse 17 even? I'm, I'm going to be overjoyed with you. Right? The mighty one, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that what we'd rather be instead of being in God's judgment, being awaiting God's disaster and stuff? Just having God say, man, that's what I'm looking for. Huh? That's what my son and daughters ought to look like. Well, and he's going to be happy because of us. 
of trying to tell the people of Judah, if you'll just change your ways, if you'll just walk in my ways and do as I told you with it, I will be overjoyed with you. And I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to be your provider. So he's giving us hope uh, where before we really had no hope. <coughs> Oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you, or early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh longs for you. In a dry and weary and thirsty land where there is no water, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion of the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. really thirst after God? Is there anything you want that you feel you need in life more than God? Where David, the author of this, but applies, I think, to what God's trying to remind his people of there. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. Is that the way you feel in your heart? In your pursuit of God, just there's a yearning there. There's a desire that just <clears throat> can't you can't be satisfied without it. I've got to have it. I've got to seek it. I've got to do whatever I gotta to do to pursue God and see Him actually operating in my life. To feel His presence. To know what it is to walk with Him. That's the heart. That's the desire of the Lord Zephaniah speaking there in verse 14 to 20 of what God says he's going to restore. But he's looking for a people that are willing. That's a question to us, like the people of Judah back then, one last time that he had, are you willing to be my people? The words of a song called God Help Me. There's a wrestling in my heart and my mind, and a disturbance of attention I cannot seem to drive. And if I'm honest, there's quite a bit of fear to sit here in the silence and really hear you. What will you ask of me? Well, I listen to your voice when you speak. Help me to move. Help me to see. Help me to do whatever you would ask of me. Help me to go. God, help me to stay. I'm feeling so alone here, and I know that you're faithful, but I can barely read. God, help me. Sometimes things, they're black and white, and sometimes they are not. That leaves us torn inside. And in the middle, we are left to wonder, who are we? What do you want? And where are we going? Oh, such a mystery I don't understand, but I believe. God, help me to move. God, help me to see. Help me to do whatever you would ask of me. Help me to go. God, help me to stay. I'm feeling so alone here, and I know that you're faithful, but I can barely breathe. God, help me. I don't know the future, it's one day at a time, but I know I'll be okay with your hand holding mine. So take all my resistance, oh God, I need your grace. One step, and then the other. Show me the way. Show me the way. God willing to show us, but his question is, are you willing to take it when he shows you? I encourage you to see one to develop a real thirst for God, and then allow him to to fill us with. Because he's willing to shape us and make us to be like you. Thank you. God bless you as you go out and shine again this week.